Hello, everyone. You are about to hear an episode on trauma-informed care, and we all realize that racism is a form of trauma. Racism is killing our patients and their families in both insidious and brutally obvious ways. We are heartbroken by the murders of George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, and too many others. But we also know that these deaths are preventable. Racism experienced across the lifespan drives health inequity. As a medical community, we must address the systemic and individual health impacts of racism, discrimination, and police brutality. We can and should do more. We commit to producing more content on racism in medicine. In fact, we're recording an episode this week to air later this month. Our team is actively planning on ways that we can highlight this more in upcoming episodes. The Curbsiders family stands in solidarity with the Black community. And now, on to the episode. This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by the American College of Physicians. Post-training doctors save $100 on their first-year membership dues through June 30th. Visit acponline.org forward slash member and use the code ACP discount. The Curbsiders are now partnering with VCU Health Continuing Education to offer CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Paul, we're going to swing right into the intro. We're back. We got a great show tonight. This is the Curbsiders. We're going to be talking about trauma-informed care with our guest, Dr. Megan Gerber. But Paul, first, tell the audience, what is what is the meaning of life? <laughs> Why are we here? Yeah, I, it's, it's a great question. I don't think they would know unless I told them. So I will tell you. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And boy, howdy, what an expert we have today. We are talking to the great Megan Gerber about trauma-informed care. But rather than monopolizing all the airtime, I'm going to pass the mic to Beth Garbs Garbatelli to tell us about our, our guest and then also about the show that we have for, for everyone tonight. Yeah, we um, have Dr. Megan Gerber on tonight. Um, she is a general internist and medical educator um, and a renowned expert in trauma-informed care. She's an associate professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and serves as a medical director of women's health for VA Boston, where she directs the Women's Health Fellowship. Dr. Gerber has also authored multiple peer-reviewed publications on intimate partner violence and women's health after trauma exposure. She's a steering committee member for the National Collaborative on Trauma-Informed Healthcare and edited the textbook Trauma-Informed Healthcare Approaches, A Guide for Primary Care, um, which is a book that I recommend to everyone. I read it probably in about less than a day if you counted up the hours. It's a really excellent starting point for understanding this topic. And Beth, I believe we have a disclaimer just because this is a difficult topic for some people. Do you want to tell tell the audience? Yeah, we recognize that this topic may bring up some upsetting thoughts or memories for some of our listeners. Um, so we're going to provide some self-care and trauma-informed resources in our show notes. Um, the practice of medicine, especially during times of a national crisis like a pandemic, can really increase our own personal exposure to trauma, traumatic events, and it can reactivate difficult memories from our past. Um, so it predisposes folks to depression and suicide risk. And we just want to reiterate that you are not alone. Um, if you are struggling with thoughts of harming yourself, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is 1-800-273-8255. Megan, thank you. Uh, this has been a long time coming, I feel. We, we made friends at a conference and, and now you're on the show. We're so happy to have you here. Can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Give them your one-liner. Thank you guys for inviting me. I absolutely love the curbsiders and it's an honor to be here. So what can I say? I'm a PGY 25 general internist working in women's health. Um, a fun story about me, I met my husband in organic chemistry lab 
in the remedial makeup group. We never had any product <laughs> at the end of our, our lab sessions. Now, somehow we managed to raise two children into young adulthood. They are still alive. Um, outside of work, I love to paint. I've been known to paint with anything I can find, and including my fingers. So that's me. Paul? No, it's just organic chemistry. That's nice because it makes me think since we're already doing a trauma episode that you and your husband came from a place of shared trauma and somehow <laughs> made this fantastic life together. I think that's wonderful. Thank um, you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask my usual question, even though I've already disclosed I don't read these, but I do I do like knowing that there are good books out there. So if you could just give me any book recommendation, does not have to be medical, but just something that you think that, that people would enjoy. What's the last good book that you've read? So I, I'm a bit of a curbsiders groupie, and I get a lot of my book recommendations here. So I was actually stressing about finding a book that hadn't already been on the podcast. And I recently discovered a wonderful set of books by Austin Kleon, K-L-E-O-N. And if you guys are anything like I am right now with totally reduced attention span, maxed on COVID reading, although, Paul, I know you're loving your COVID email inbox. Uh, <laughs> um, these are wonderful little graphic inspiring books. They're illustrated with his doodles and collages. And I recently read one called Keep Going, which is about staying focused and creative and productive. It's written for artists, but I think it's 100% useful for us. It really could be applied to any content crea uh, creation, like writing, writing manuscripts, writing narratives, uh, podcasting. And it's really spoke, it spoke to me during the strange time of sort of suspended animation. We've lost our conferences and our presentations are canceled and we're just cut off from all our normal events and deadlines. So Cleon talks a lot about, we, we mentioned earlier, going on airplane mode, don't wake up to the newsfeed on your phone. And just pay extra attention to the ordinary stuff. You know, your attention is really one of the most valuable things you possess. Protect it. So it's a really fun little book and uh, good read. Excellent recommendation. Beth, did you want to ask anything? Um, let's see. Well, I you kind of talk about this a little bit in your um, discussion of a good book for this time. But one question I was thinking I would ask, and it might be helpful for all of these episodes we're doing during the pandemic, but what are things that you are thinking about during the day that kind of inspire you or motivate you? Um, I'm just kind of curious to hear like people's coping strategies for this time, because I need some from, of my own <laughs> to add. <laughs> That's a really good one. I mean, I think I like to notice things that I wouldn't normally notice. So um, I'm taking a narrative writing class uh, at BU and we just had the class right before the podcast recording and folks were just talking about birds and all these birds that they'd never noticed. And so everything is quieter outside. And even though I'm still going into the hospital and I think, you know, we all are, we're not sort of the people who are at home and bored, we're, we're working and going into work, but I am noticing more things and, and trying to kind of focus a little bit more on nature. I planted some wildflowers the other day, just randomly planted a bag of wildflower seeds. So just trying to notice things that, that I would never notice otherwise. There's that there's that uh, viral video that was going around yesterday about some some guy reading his kid a, a bedtime story that that talks about that sort of thing. You know, some try trying to look at the bright side of this whole uh, forced forced isolation at home with your families. Well, I can't remember if I recommended this. There's a and this wouldn't be my pick if we're doing those, but there's a book called Have you Have you read any Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek? Yeah. If you're familiar, yeah, because that whole thing is about the profundity and amazingness of nature and also how profoundly stupid it is. But it's all about <laughs> it's all about just sort of paying attention and noticing things and and taking account of, of things. It's really it's a remarkable book. It's one of the most beautifully written things I've read. So, um, yeah, if you're familiar with it, it sounds like you would enjoy it. But I, it's, I would recommend it to everyone if you've not had a chance and you're in the mood for something that's not fiction. Yeah, thank you. Megan, I'd like to ask you about some of your favorite advice you've had in your career. Great question. So I kind of went through my mental Rolodex or what did Sherlock Holmes call it? Mind palace. Um, <laughs> trying to remember. <laughs> you mean sketchy, right? That's what a mind palace is. <laughs> Sorry, med student joke over here. 
<laughs> yeah. Trying, trying to think about what would be a really pithy thing to say from my training. And I have to say that the best lesson so far was from my high school English teacher who used to say, anticipation is greater than realization. It just keeps coming back to me, like just thinking about it, planning for it is a whole lot different than just doing it. Just jump in and do it. Stop thinking about it. So that's kind of carried me through a lot. All right. I think we might have time for a pick of the week uh, from Paul and Beth, if if they have them. Uh, Beth, why don't you go first? You don't you don't get to be on the show that often. What <laughs> you've given some great picks in the past. I've got two picks of the week, but I'll be very brief. Um, one is a recipe, which is a little bit of a non traditional pick, um, but it's Molly's Hala, and it's on King Arthur Flower. It's from this food blogger Molly Ye, and it's just a really foolproof, amazing foray into bread making, which I know a lot of people are exploring right now. Um, and I just I find it to be one of those recipes you can come back to and kind of like riff on it if you want. I sometimes put cheddar in it and like kind of make it not a hala and kind of make it like more of a cheddar loaf, but it's it's really fun, really reliable. And if you use it, um, if you if you use that recipe, recommend using a scale too. That would be my my other rec. Uh, Beth, don't make me buy a scale. I beg of you. <laughs> I've been fighting it. For <laughs> it will change your world, Paul. I was so uh, resistant. I was so I was like, no, I I don't use that. I don't know, no. But it's it's changed my baking game. So I I very much think it's a good thing to have. Okay, all right, because it's you. Right. <laughs> And what was the what was the other one? Did I miss it, or is that you gave one pick? What well, was the other one? Or it's a scale. <laughs> well, the scale is the other pick, but my other <laughs> real pick was um, I've just started. I just discovered Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and that's been a really fun show. It's like your standard monster of the week. I'm sure everybody else knows this. I'm like 20 years late to the party, <laughs> um, but it's a fun kind of growing up story too, and gives a little bit of drama, teen teen you know angst and stuff, but also fun monsters and yeah. <laughs> In your defense, when it came out, you probably were not of age to be watching it. So I, I fully <laughs> accept your apology. Paul, what about you? I'm going to recommend um, a miniseries that I've been obsessed over that was relegated to the, this off-label streaming service. So no one's seen it, probably, unless you went looking for it. But it's the show Devs. It's an eight-part miniseries um, written, directed by Alex Garland, who you may know directed Ex Machina. And in some ways, it's a companion piece to that. He also directed Annihilation, which is one of my favorite movies um, that I think is about depression. But you can kind of put whatever you think about is on it at the same time. And it's just that the basic plot is uh, about this character, Lily, whose boyfriend goes to work for a mysterious software company and then vanishes and her trying to put together sort of what's happened. But obviously, uh, over the course of eight hours, it's actually a much bigger show about what it means to be human and do we have free will um, or is everything deterministic? It is one of the most visibly like visually beautiful things I've seen to look at. Like it had, it looks way better than it has any business looking. It has Nick Offerman playing a completely um, against casting and is, is amazing. So the whole thing is just, it made me think it was just gorgeous, beautifully directed, beautifully written. Um, didn't quite stick the landing, but it's still well worth the seven hours and change that I invested in it. So I, I would highly recommend um, devs, if you like science fiction, that reminds you how bleak human experience can be. Which st- service was it on? It's uh, FX on Hulu, I believe. Okay, I'll... you can get it on Amazon Prime for what it's worth. You can buy yeah. all all eight episodes for thirteen bucks if you if you trust me, which I wouldn't. I've given some sketchy recommendations <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Uh, I'll just recommend uh, people read some Terry Pratchett, uh, the Discworld series. I'm a big fan, uh, Night's, The Night's Watch. And I just read We Free Med, which is a different book in that series. ACP is the professional home for internists and a fierce advocate for the internal medicine profession and for patients. One of the many reasons I am proud to be an ACP member is this fierce advocacy. And the ACP continues to advocate for physicians and patients, pushing for immediate steps that our current administration Congress, state governments, and private sector stakeholders can help take to address this current situation. I'm also a big fan of the Physician's Guide that offers frequently updated COVID-19 resources. They provide things like a clinical overview of infection control. They provide guidance for patient care and information related to billing and coding to help you navigate the current telehealth landscape. These are just a few of the many reasons ACP members are proud to be internists and to be a part of the college. Right now, post-training docs can save $100 on their first year membership dues through June 30th. Visit acponline.org forward slash member and use the code ACP discount. Let's let's get on to the the actual topic tonight. Beth, I think we're going to start off with a case or or maybe two cases from Cashlack, 
and then and we'll get into the topic here. Yeah, um, we drafted up two cases this week just because we wanted to show that there can be kind of multiple ways that trauma-informed care can come up. And um, the first case is Don Joe, a 24-year-old recent college graduate who's new to your practice. On his intake forms, he marks off a family history of heart disease and hypertension, but reports no specific health concerns. His social history is unknown. And case two is Jane Doe. Um, a 43-year-old social worker who used to see another practitioner in your group who just relocated out of state. She's been moved into your care. Her chart is notable for migraine and insomnia. During your first visit, she appears withdrawn and mentions up front that she does not like the doctor's office. Um, So we chose these two cases just to highlight that in some ways, uh, trauma-informed care can be seen as a universal precaution um, in that you might have a patient like Don Joe who you don't have a social history and you don't have any major known risk factors. Um, And the other case is a person who maybe is exposed to some traumatic experiences um, due to her work in social, social work. Um, And this can also apply to other healthcare professionals. Um, And she's maybe displaying some signs that she does have some discomfort in a medical setting. Um, So to sort of kick it off, um, we'd really be curious, um, Megan, if you could, Describe to us what is trauma defined as and who are people who experience trauma? Those are great questions. So, um, you know, trauma has many different definitions and it can be so subjective. So something that's highly traumatic for one person may be less disturbing for another. Um, I like the SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration definition which is that individual trauma results from an event, a series of events or set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So I think it's really important when we think about trauma to think of it as a process also. Um, trauma is not just something that happens in the past and it's done and it's behind you. People experience trauma with intrinsic protective and vulnerability factors, right? People come into traumatic experiences with different sets of tools, different sets of genes, different sets of uh, families of origin. And trauma in childhood um, is particularly damaging because it occurs during uh, developmental windows. So, you, you asked Beth who experiences trauma, really it could be anyone. It's incredibly common um, and not equally distributed throughout society, but I think when we really start to look at how common trauma is, we become a little less nervous about it. It's just out there and it's, it's, it's really common. Megan, this, this term trauma-informed care is one that I probably first heard during the course of the show, which uh, in probably in the past year or two, it's not a it's not a term that that I was aware of before. Then maybe that was just me being naive. But why do you think it's come so much to the forefront now, and and why should people think of this as important? I don't think Matt that you're unusual at all. In fact, there really have not been consistent sets of competencies in undergraduate medical education or in graduate medical education. So a lot of trauma-informed care curriculum, a lot of curriculum on trauma is sort of catch as catch can. It's it's medical school dependent. It's faculty dependent in a lot of places. And I, I think I heard that you were, um, you know, uh, you were championing some curriculum, right, Beth? I'm getting a little (laughs) tongue-tied. But yeah, and and you're not alone. There are a number of medical students around the country who have actually been leading the push at their medical schools to get uh, trauma-informed care curriculum into the schedule. It's just not there. So you're you're not alone. It's, It's And why now? That's a great question. So I think the Me Too movement was helpful. Um, I think there were a lot of people in medicine, especially in general internal medicine, who've been doing trauma work, work in intimate partner violence, um, trauma and substance abuse disorder for years and years. Um, so the medical, the medical field, especially general internal medicine, has been very aware of the health effects of trauma for a long time. But I do think the Me Too movement has probably lit a fire <laughs> 
under some of the more popular discourse and attention that trauma is getting, um, even in popular media. So, and this, and like Matt said, this is a show we've talked about doing for a while, and I think we've asked each other multiple times, but what exactly is trauma-informed care? And then I don't think, none, I, at least I certainly have not been able to come up with a definition that satisfies me, in part because I don't fully understand what it is. So maybe you can help me out. If there's, Is there a simple way to describe to the to someone who's not familiar with the concept, what trauma-informed care entails, understanding it's a big, big, broad topic. It is, and there are a lot of different ways of approaching it. And um, I think one of you said earlier that the trauma-informed care is really about practicing universal trauma precautions. And that really is what, it, what it's, that's what is at its most fundamental um, basis. So trauma-informed care is considered a strengths-based approach that, that fosters recovery and healing through safe and collaborative relationships. So the idea is that trauma survivors often have had their trust violated and may have had previous negative experiences, especially with healthcare, with procedures, with healthcare clinicians. So the goal is to really avoid inadvertently re-traumatizing patients while fostering collaborative and trusting care. And I'm sure you have seen the um, the core components that are defined by SAMHSA, and we'll be very practical about this, but they basically include safety. So creating a safe space in the healthcare environment, a place where if somebody did want to disclose, he or she or they would feel safe disclosing, would feel accepted, would feel welcome. Um, trustworthiness and transparency, be straightforward, uh, be direct with patients, let patients know if you need to do something, why you need to do it, um, show patients that you're worthy of their trust. Peer support is another one, um, helping patients find peer support in the medical center, peer-to-peer -peer programs, collaboration and mutuality. So even though we're often in a rush in medical encounters, trying to make sure that we're engaging in decision-making um, and giving patients empowerment, voice, and choice are really important. Um, so you might give a patient a choice of whether to have a lab or not instead of telling the patient, go to the lab. And then finally, sensitivity to cultural, historical, and gender issues. So being aware, especially some of our hospitals are in um, communities that experience high rates of community violence, of racism, um, structural violence, historical violence, um, and just being aware that often the community itself has experienced a lot of collective trauma and coming into the medical center itself can be difficult. This seems like the, I think it's the second chapter in your book that talks about trauma-informed care. And it had this great case that, that ran through it about this, was it Redwood Health System where the health system is, and it talks about how complex and this this is to enact, where the health system is training all its personnel, the front desk staff, all the all the primary care docs or providers, and they're all like learning about this so that they could be kind of in tune to the fact that patients in the community may have had trauma, and then the health system is attending community events and learning about what's going on in the community and they're hiring up people from the community to work and help navigate the system. Like it's, it's a big thing. There's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to it. It was, it, uh, it was that, that case I thought was really great to sort of uh, like kind of show what this was like in motion. Um, so maybe, maybe on a micro level, maybe we can go macro in a bit, but Beth had presented the cases of John Doe and Jane Doe, what might some of the trauma informed care things look like when John Doe is like checking into the office and like as you bring him back to talk to him? Let's say in some point in the future we'll be seeing patients in an exam room again. What what might that look like? Yeah, so I mean the first thing to remember, um this is a 24-year-old man and I think if you don't understand trauma, you may assume, oh, 24-year-old college graduate, he's fine, he's never experienced trauma. But when you think about the prevalence of trauma in in our country, um, just it's in, it's incredible. Um, his, uh, the potential, let me think for a minute. Um, so 24% of men 
um, under the age of 18 have experienced sexual assault. And this is from the CDC National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey data. So like almost a quarter of young men have experienced sexual assault under the age of 18. Um, And I think just given the prevalence of trauma, we have to think this young man may have experienced trauma. He's presenting as young and healthy, and we don't know anything about his social history, so we're not going to start necessarily asking him about trauma. We may just go through a regular medical visit and get to know him, Um, but we would keep in the back of our minds that he could have been trauma exposed, and just because he's a young man doesn't exempt him from that possibility. Social history is really important. Um, Is he using substances? Um, Did he go to online school? Um, Does he exercise? Where does he live? Um, The more you know about him, the more likely you are to discover that he may have been exposed to trauma and he might not have been. But I think the important thing is to not exclude trauma um, from your differential for anyone, really. I'm really curious about the role of screening in trauma-informed care. Um, And I listened to um, an episode from another podcast, um, Physician's Guide for Doctoring, and I thought it kind of spurred an interesting conversation with with that podcast. Um, But the idea that screening can be really important and impactful and obviously a big part of trauma-informed care, but there's limitations. And I'd really just love to hear you expound on that a little bit. And if a person like this comes in, do you immediately want to screen you know, any patient that walks in your door with like a paper screener of asking if they've had a traumatic experience and is that in any way re-traumatizing? And I'd just really love to hear you unpack that a little bit. Sure. So um, I think that it depends on what definition of trauma-informed care you read. And there are people who feel that inquiry, direct inquiry for trauma history is a very big part of trauma-informed care. I think the majority of people working in the field really feel that screening is something that you do when you're ready to do it. So, for example, there are things that we screen for in primary care that are evidence-based. So the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends screening women of reproductive age for intimate partner violence. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force does not recommend screening for adverse childhood experiences or for lifetime intimate partner violence or for military sexual trauma. So there are many forms of trauma that are, that, that are not recommended uh, things to screen for. So I think one approach in a practice can be to screen for specific forms of trauma. It's hard to argue that you should be screening for something that isn't evidence-based and recommended for everyone. In other words, if you don't have an evidence base for universal screening, it's going to be very hard to convince an internal medicine practice that has 15 or 20 minute visits that every single patient should be screened for adverse childhood experiences, for example. It's an easier sell to convince the practice to screen for intimate partner violence. So I think screening is important, but it can't be seen as sort of an integral part of trauma-informed care. You can practice a trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive approach without knowing a thing about the trauma history. So I think I shared with you Sheila Raja's paper from 2015, and she has a nice pyramid with screening being at the top of the pyramid that not every system is ready to engage in screening. Not every system has something to offer to patients that are screened. So again, I think it's important to screen um, for things that are evidence-based and um, recommended for universal screening in our population. And I think the rest of the approach can be more of a case-finding approach. So there are several ways of, of, of going about this in internal medicine. So the first would be to ask open-ended questions about trauma um, or open-ended questions that could get at trauma. Um, The second would be to screen for specific types of trauma. And then the third approach would be to just do universal education in the practice. So the practice has pamphlets, it has um, posters, it has... um, things that cue patients that it's acceptable to talk about these things. So I think that this can be done on a continuum, but I 
don't think that screening and trauma-informed care need to be synonymous and that trauma-informed care can occur without screening. I think one of the components of trauma-informed care that you go over in the book is actually this idea of containment. And I wonder if you could sort of talk to me if there's any friction between this idea of containment. Tell me what that is exactly so I make sure I'm understanding it. And then also, is there potential to re-traumatize by doing recommended screening? And how do you sort of balance those two things? So I think um, the containment um, strategy comes from Lee Kimberg. She has a four C's and contain is um, partially refers to creating a, a sense of safety for the patient and also containing the history so that you're not um, eliciting a detailed, um, you know, minute by minute history of the trauma. So in other words, you can allude to something difficult that happened in your past or um, a challenging experience in childhood or a difficult relationship um, without eliciting every single detail of, of an assault. So I think that that is the, the definition of containment. In psychotherapy, containment um, alludes to creating a safe space and um, helping a, a person feel comfortable. Um, so the the word has two meanings, really. So it's it's kind of like uh, I, I have to relate everything to movies or TV. Um, Goodwill Hunting, when he's finally telling Robin Williams about all the things, like he got burned by cigarettes and things like that. But he's in a therapist's office, and that was th- that's a person who is credentialed to help him with work through that sort of things in a primary care office. Finding out that there was trauma is our goal and and maybe helping the patient realize how that might relate to their overall health or their behaviors, but we're going to be referring them to someone that is trained to deal with whatever type of trauma they've been through. Am I understanding correctly? Yes. And I think, you know, the question is, do patients want to talk about trauma? And I think my answer is sometimes and at the right time. So screen if you have the resources to help. Screen if it's an evidence-based recommendation. Um, There are certainly many studies of women, for example, with intimate partner violence that have found that survivors want to be asked sensitively about their trauma histories. And in general, when survivors talk about their preferences for medical care, both in qualitative research and in, you know, um, support groups, The big concern with inquiry is not the asking itself. It's either repetitive asking or it's patients being asked to recount a detailed history of a traumatic experience for purposes of documentation. So I think in general, we worry a lot about re-traumatizing patients by asking them about trauma. But first of all, a lot of our adult patients have been carrying these things for years Um, They often will refer to this as a burden, and they're often very willing to talk about it. Um, Again, the exact details of the trauma don't matter as much as the fact that something difficult, frightening, horrible happened. Um, I think that we are much more likely to re-traumatize patients in clinical settings through um, inadvertently through things we do during exams or through history taking and that the inquiry itself, um, I I would try to be a little less afraid about inquiry. And I think, you know, just to kind of recap, there are a number of approaches to inquiry. And I, I know that we may be talking about adverse childhood experiences a little bit more, but there are many forms of trauma that we just don't screen for. I mean, we don't screen for racism. We don't screen for community violence. We don't screen for um, human trafficking. We don't screen for childhood maltreatment among adult patients. And certainly screening for adverse childhood experiences in adults remains controversial. Um, So I think you're never going to be able to ask a patient about every single type of trauma, he, she, or they, may have experienced. Um, and asking general open-ended questions can be very helpful. So again, I think we over, I think we exaggerate the risk of re-traumatization with asking. I really do. That's 
incredibly helpful. I think I was thinking specifically about the framework for intimate partner violence in the screening and the asking, are, do you feel safe is, is actually, at least so I've been teaching, not, a, not sufficient. Like, so they're actually, the, some of the screening tools are pretty explicit in terms of what you're asking about, whether it's physical violence or sexual violence or humiliation or that kind of thing. But so it sounds to me like it's okay to screen using those tools, but the actual details of the violence itself is not, it's not your job or it's not necessary to elicit it unless the patient's ready to talk about it. Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely. And, you know, here's, a, here's another example. So I think some people, some of my colleagues will often say, have you experienced difficult life experiences such as uh, growing up in a family where you were hurt? Um, the PCPTSD-5, which is the PTSD screening instrument used at the VA, asks a really nice STEM question, which is sometimes things happen to people that are unusually or especially frightening, horrible, or traumatic, for example. And then it goes through a list. And if the patient says no, then they're not screened for PTSD. If the patient says yes, but the patient doesn't have to come out and say, I was sexually assaulted or I watched an earthquake destroy my village. They, they don't have to say that. And I, I can share recently, um, Jeffrey Milstein, a, a general internal medicine colleague from Penn, just published a beautiful piece in JGIM. I don't know if you guys saw this. Um, and he advocated for using the question, have you experienced anything that makes seeing a doctor difficult or scary for you? And I thought that was just absolutely wonderful. Again, there's no RCT of that question. That's not the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force doesn't recommend it. But getting, you know, getting used to asking an open-ended question that might get somebody to acknowledge that they've had past experiences that make medical care, receipt of medical care difficult for them is a useful skill. So I want to recap a little bit and then try to uh, dig in a little bit to like uh, some of the mechanics of an office visit. So the universal precautions that that you had mentioned, and I think Beth had mentioned it earlier, that's kind of like assuming that every patient likely had some trauma and just being in tune with that, the office is going to be, hopefully our office staff and our personnel will be trained in trauma-informed care, just kind of knowing that people may have had trauma. There's going to be signs and pamphlets making people know that this is like a safe environment to talk about this kind of thing if they want to. And uh, it'll hopefully be quiet and calm in the environment. And if we're case finding, if something happens in the office visit and the patient discloses something to us, we don't have to drag out all the the gory details of things. We're just going to um, try to connect them with help for whatever kind of trauma they've been through. So uh, did I miss any of the major stuff we talked about so far before we get, I want to go back to our cases and kind of dig into them a little bit more. So at which, so let's say we have Don Joe, that's Beth, that name really just does something to my brain. It's hard for me to, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you actually, you called him John Doe earlier. I was going to correct you, but it was in the, it was in the heat of the moment and I just let it go. But. So Don Joe, which I, my head's going to explode. Uh, so he's our 24 year old gentleman. It's the first visit. Uh, the first visit with him, we take a social history. Would you unload that that great question that you just gave us? That that open ended question. Would you potentially un- unleash that in your first visit, or would you wait until maybe he's maybe he's seeing you like every couple months with these vague somatic complaints, and sometimes he flakes out and doesn't show up at all, and he's just given a little bit of a weird vibe. Or would you potentially just do that the first time you meet somebody? I don't know that there's a right answer. I think um, you can play it by ear. And um, I think what you're really trying to do at that first visit, even with a young man, and the reason I say even with a young man is that we know that young men are just less likely to come in for medical care. Um, they're, they're not a group that, that comes in for preventive medical care. They tend to come in when they have an injury right? And then we see them when they're older. So I think it's a great opportunity. You certainly could ask him an open-ended question. You might also just spend time getting to know him. I mean, that's the other thing I I really want to stress that it's not a miss if you don't figure out that someone's experienced trauma. I mean, you, this could go on for years before you actually figure this out. 
So I think we're, we're so wired, especially in internal medicine, to take these very detailed histories and nail the diagnosis and nail the history, and the patient may not be ready to talk to you. So I think it's fine not to ask him a direct question if, in, you know, for some reason he has a substance use history or has a great deal of chronic pain um, or other medical findings that you wouldn't expect in a 24-year-old. You could delve further into a, a history of childhood maltreatment or community violence. Can I, and maybe this is the wrong way to ask this, but is there... Are there certain parts of the history where people go wrong and ask questions in ways that are counterproductive? So I, I guess if you could correct some of the common, I, I don't want to say mistakes, but if you could see, if you could sort of improve the way that people ask questions during at least the history or sort of the part of the, the actual interview itself, what, what parts um, could be done better in your estimation? So I think there are a couple of things. I mean, I think one is um, not developing a sense of safety for the patient. So, you know, if somebody seems agitated or anxious, that's really not the time to ask them about a trauma history. Um, I think the other thing is is reading, and we, we've all probably done this, we have so many kind of clinical reminder prompts in our electronic health records, but reading a question in a very wooden or robotic way from uh, from the electronic health record and then, you know, having your face in the in the computer and the computer screen when the person starts disclosing um you know i think i think the mistakes or the errors in asking occur when you're either not reading the patient well you don't know the patient well or you haven't created a sense of safety and trust to to begin that discussion and related yeah. to that a bit, I'm, I'm kind of curious um, what pitfalls people may fall into with the physical exam as well, um, since I'm just curious how we can best develop a trauma-informed physical exam. I think there's sort of the understanding that pelvic exam and, you know, prostate exam are things that are sen- more sensitive for patients. Um, but what are other ways that we can make that a safer space for someone who's maybe experienced trauma? That's a great question, Beth, and I think there are a lot of opportunities in the physical exam. And first of all, we make assumptions about what parts of the body may have experienced trauma, and we're often very wrong. So I'm sure that you've all had the experience of looking in someone's throat and finding that it was terrifying for them. So I think the important thing with physical exam is to avoid any kind of personalizing language. So... Um, You want to avoid personalizing language. You want to obtain consent for each part of the exam, and I'll go through how that works. And you um, want to be sure that the patient knows when and why you're doing something. So um, a number of years ago, I was on service, and I watched a, a resident put his hands on the neck of a patient to examine the gentleman's thyroid and the guy happened to be a veteran and jumped about three feet in the air and was terrified because one of the ways that we're trained to do the thyroid exam is coming up behind the patient and putting our hands on the patient's neck. So a patient should always be able to see you. You should not approach a patient from behind. The first thing to do is to obtain consent. Um, avoid any kind of personalizing language in that. By that, I mean, um, in order to evaluate your sore throat, I will need to look in the back of the mouth. Is that okay with you? So you would not say something like, open your mouth for me. And we've all said, open your mouth for me so many times. Um, We're in a rush and we're just, you know, it's a throat exam. It's a sore throat, you know, open your mouth. So in order to examine the throat, um, I will need to ask you if you can open the mouth for me. Um, As I do an exam, (laughs) so strange, I haven't done an exam now in weeks, but, and we can talk about telehealth, but as I do an exam, I have developed the habit of keeping up a running dialogue with the patient. Next, um, we will need to examine your thyroid gland. It's a gland that sits in the middle of the neck. In order to do that, I would need to put my hands here on your neck. I try to stand off to the side. So you always want the patient to be able to see you. You want to ask um, 
If permission to do the exam, let them know what's coming next. There should be no unexpected touching. This is true for all patients. The other thing that I've gotten in the habit of doing is just asking a patient to disrobe to their level of comfort. So not getting into the sort of robotic mindset where everybody has to be stripped down um, to their underwear and in a Johnny. They don't. You know they don't. Yes, you know, it's nice to look at somebody's skin, but that's something you should be obtaining consent for. Does this take more time? I don't think it takes more time when you get in the habit of doing it. When you get in the habit of asking for consent and narrating what you're doing and making sure you're in the patient's field of vision, it becomes very automatic. So Megan, we're we're doing our exam, and actually, we we learned a couple of weeks back. Uh, we examine the thyroid with the thumbs now, so we don't have to come at someone from behind. But you still have to tell them you're going to touch their neck with your thumbs. And so this this patient, uh, Don Joe, still I still can't get used to that name. Uh, so Don Joe, we're we're examining him, and if if he discloses discloses that there's been some trauma, he had some adverse childhood events who are some of the go-to resource people in our clinic? Because if I think one of the worst case scenarios would be if, if you didn't know what to do when you, when someone admits to you that they've had uh, a trauma. So who are some of the go-to people in your clinic? I'm about to start a new job in the next few months and I don't know what resources are available. So great question. So first of all, somebody might disclose trauma to you and that might be it. Like they may not want to see an advocate or a social worker or a therapist. So I, I think after a disclosure, and we actually practice this with trainees, it's, it's a really good skill to practice because when somebody does disclose trauma, it can be a little shocking. You can be a little taken aback, right? So coming, um, coming, responding with an empathic response, like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That sounds very difficult. Always being very validating is important. And I think the next question has to be, how much difficulty is this causing you in your current life? So if the patient has, you know, can't get into relationships, um, is having trouble leaving the house, is having horrible nightmares, um, the trauma and the um, results or the symptoms of the trauma have created um barriers to that person living um, a happy and healthy life, then they may want therapy or they may want a social worker. So what are, what are the minimum things to have on hand? Well, certainly for specific types of trauma, especially if somebody's in any kind of immediate danger, having hotline numbers, there are hotline numbers for intimate partner violence, there are hotline numbers for human trafficking. A lot of health systems have developed palm cards and things that you can have in the office. I have even been in situations where I needed to offer a patient a hotline from the office because I was working in a neighborhood health center and we did not have a social worker on site. Social work referrals are great. Some larger healthcare systems have advocates who will actually come. They carry a pager and they'll come to the clinic and they'll they'll talk with you with the patient. Um, but I think the important thing is to find out how much difficulty. It, you know, number one is it acute trauma? Is the patient in immediate danger? Number two, if it's past trauma, how much difficulty is this causing for this patient? And is it enough that the patient is ready to talk to someone? The patient might just want to talk to you like, hey, doc, I'm really glad I was able to talk with you about this. Yes, I think this is probably increasing my drinking. I just want to talk to you about reducing my drinking. And and that can happen, right? So those are some of the ideas for resources. Um, and it's it's never a bad idea for a clinic or a practice to decide ahead of time, what should our resources be? What is our go-to? And I talked earlier about a universal education approach, which is just having a lot of information there. Great. For patients. Yeah. And I guess that sort of segues into the the next question that I had is, what does a, a trauma-informed practice look like? Like, for instance, something I've been thinking a lot about is what does a trauma-informed waiting room look like? I feel like waiting rooms can be a place where there is potential for chaos and noise and, and things that are a little bit of chaos. So how... 
what practically can we do to sort of minimize that? Well, in general, uh, trauma-informed care really is a form of patient-centered care, and waiting rooms are kind of not that patient-centered, right? They're often just kind of warehouses for people to sit in. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but many, many kind of um, forward-thinking practices have even gotten rid of waiting rooms, but we're not going to be able to do that anytime soon. So I think one important thing with waiting rooms is rearranging the chairs so that people are not clustered really close to one another. Um, trying to get patients back into exam rooms and out of the waiting room as quickly as possible. Um, we talked, I know, in, in the book about colors on the walls and reducing ambient noise and trying to make sure that doors don't slam. And there are very cheap things that you can purchase that, that will keep doors from slamming. And I've, I've really been shocked. I learned this from my patients, that slamming doors are terrifying. So I think if you, you're working in a safety net setting, you're working in a practice that sees a lot of patients, you're not going to be able to get rid of the waiting room or um, completely redesign it. But certainly trying to rearrange the chairs so people have a choice of not being um, seated in one another's personal bubble. And I'm assuming we're going to be going in that direction with COVID anyway. And um, trying to make the environment as soothing as possible. One of the other questions that is similar, uh, a little bit related as well, let's say patients, uh, we have a lot of trauma in the community where we're practicing and we're getting a lot of patients disclosing traumas to us. That can start to wear on the staff. How, how can we deal with that? How can we prepare people for that? So that's a really great question, Matt, and I think it's it's very common. And I think in internal medicine, we are working with a lot of trauma survivors because we manage a lot of chronic disease, substance use, mental, mental health conditions. A lot of us work in academic safety net settings. So we're constantly um, working with patients who've experienced um, all sorts of adverse life events. And I can speak from experience that it's very important to be mindful of compassion fatigue and even vicarious traumatization. So um, one important thing, I think, is just calming and grounding yourself before a visit. Like, sometimes I'll know that somebody was very frustrating or even a little rude to me, and I'm like, I'll see that person's name on the schedule, and I'll just be like, oh, no. And it's just sometimes taking a minute outside the door, taking a deep breath, trying to remember what may have resulted in this person's behavior um, what's at the root that's driving the patient's presentation can be very helpful. This person is not being angry, difficult, or manipulative. They may actually be a person who's frightened or triggered. Um, so I find that in general, embracing a trauma-informed approach helps me feel less frustrated and angry with some of the behaviors patients may exhibit. It's also really important to give yourself a pass on the metrics, and we didn't really talk about that earlier, but if you get into a whole discussion about a difficult life experience, you may not get through all of those clinical prompts, and that patient's A1C is going to be over nine, and you did the much more important thing, I think. Yeah, you're not going to fix that A1C unless you deal with the trauma if that's what's on the patient's mind. Yeah. Well, the good news is I have not clicked on a best practice advisory in about seven years. So, it's, it's, <laughs> so I feel like I'm already well equipped. Great. I think we're running short on time. So I want to see if Beth or Paul have any uh, like last minute questions. And then Megan, of course, will give you the last word, your, your take home points or anything else that you really wanted to leave the audience with before we let you go. I guess in the age of COVID-19 and this pandemic, what issues have you seen arising in the realm of trauma-informed care? And what are things that we can do to mitigate um, any trauma impacts that are occurring during this time, either re-traumatizing people or people kind of experiencing a really serious trauma for the first time? Thank you for that question. It's a great question. And, and you you guys mentioned earlier just the, the trauma of having covid of recovering from um, an ICU stay, of our fellow healthcare workers who've been exposed to really awful, um, ex you know, just 
death and dying of young patients and people who were never expected to die. But apart from that, I think there's some really good literature from the SARS era that suggests that there are lasting mental health consequences from pandemics like this, and that people with pre-existing mental and physical health concerns, people with pre-existing trauma, are going to have a higher risk of post-traumatic stress disorder and um, vulnerability to trauma-related issues. Um, Many of those same patients will also bear the brunt of social and economic consequences, right? So a lot of our lower wage workers, a lot of people who can't social distance and have to go out to work and live in high density neighborhoods in, in urban centers are also the very same people who are experiencing high rates of community violence. So post-disaster research after SARS really suggested I think it was a lot of this was done in Canada and in Asia, like high rates of um, PTSD and depression and substance use. And though the folks with pre-existing trauma conditions, trauma exposure rather, are really going to be the people who are most affected. Um, folks have been talking about a second pandemic of, of mental health conditions. So the other thing I'll say is that social distancing um, takes away social support, right? And so one of the problems with social distancing is that social support mitigates the um, adverse effects of, of trauma. And a lot of people have lost their ability to reach out um, beyond their home. Um, they no longer have their social support networks. A lot of people go to work and get away from abusive spouses. So you've all heard that there's been a lot of concern about increases in intimate partner violence and also in child abuse because of, uh, I won't say the quarantine, but social distancing. So it's, I think as we start to recover from this, we're going to be seeing a lot of unseen trauma and suffering that wasn't what, you know, everybody's thinking about how horrible COVID looks, but there's a sort of secondary set of issues. Yeah, I think one of the patients that has stuck with me the most recently is someone who, you know, if someone was even suspicious for COVID, they were transferred to a separate wing of Cash Stock North. Um, for testing and they were just sort of isolated there and when he tested negative and came back and I was taking care of this patient they just they literally begged me to please not go back there like they were just terrified of this room with a zipper and no one wanted to come in and talk to them when they were surrounded by sick people and you could just the, the you could tell the entire event even though it was good news like your neck was <laughs> intensely intensely traumatizing to them to the extent that they would have rather left than gone back there so it's the whole experience even in the absence of this horrific health outcomes is still was highly traumatic to this patient, completely understandably so. Megan, I think this is all we have time for. This was like definitely thought provoking. I think we're just touching the tip of the iceberg with this. Can you remind the audience a couple of your favorite take home points, or or maybe even points you didn't get to get to during the episode, and uh, they can seek you out on social media, on Twitter or wherever. I know you're on Twitter a bunch. They can they can seek you out on Twitter if they have follow up questions. Um, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so take home points. Uh, trauma is really common. It's actually shockingly common. Um, the stigma attached to childhood maltreatment and sexual violence is lifted somewhat. But when you start to look at the world through the lens of how common trauma is, you stop being scared of it and tiptoeing around it. Um, and if you start to think that perhaps traumatic exposure in some shape or form is more of a norm. It, it gets you more comfortable with accepting that the root of patients, you know, poor adherence or difficulty with behavior change or adverse coping behaviors is due to trauma. That being said, you don't need to know the exact details of a person's trauma to be trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive. Um, and I think, you know, remember that trauma exposure may shed light on why some of our patients seem hard to engage, they seem demanding or on edge or easily upset, and why some patients, like we just talked about the A1C over 9, why some conditions remain refractory to intervention. These may be patients who've experienced trauma. Um, and I think, you know, we just said that trauma-informed care is good patient-centered care, and some of you may think 
be listening to this and say, you know, I'm already doing this. I'm already telling a patient what I do during a physical exam. And you probably are. There are a lot of pieces of trauma-informed care that are just really good collaborative patient-centered care. Megan, thank you so much. Did you have anything you wanted to plug, maybe a book on this topic, or or it could be something else altogether if you want? Well, I did edit a textbook um, on trauma-informed care in 2019. It's uh, published by Springer. It's called Trauma-Informed Healthcare Approaches, a Guide for Primary Care. And I will share that Springer does allow me to share chapters for academic purposes, so I'd be happy to share pieces with of the book with anyone who's interested. All right. That's uh, let's uh, let's more aggressively plug that. So having I bought the book and it's really really good and you should own the book too. So it's yeah, yeah, don't give away don't give away for free. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The other thing that's really cool that just to keep an eye out for is the whole concept of trauma informed telehealth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I recently I did a a podcast interview on trauma informed telehealth and just some practical advice for doing trauma-informed care and telehealth, which is challenging. And then several of us have tried to get a review published. Um, So that's a whole other interesting topic. If you want to send us the trauma-informed telehealth, uh, we can put that in the show notes uh, because I think people would be interested in that too. Actually, I am immediately interested in that because I've been trying to figure out telehealth for the past three weeks now. Where will that be? The podcast yeah. is on, it's called the Women Centered Health Podcast, and I will send it to you. It's It should release really soon. And it was, they, they really wanted to talk very specifically about telehealth. And they were, they were really interested in whether gynecologists are doing kind of genital exams and things like that. Oh, and, gosh. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there, there have been some interesting discussions of that. I mean, the only other, the only other pearl that I can think of that I didn't mention on the podcast that I think is important is just asking a patient before a physical exam, is, is there a way that we can make you more comfortable during this exam? Right? Because patients, patients have had pelvic exams, they've had rectal exams, they've had mammograms, they, they know what works for them. And then that gives them an opportunity to say, I feel better if I can listen to music, or which is another tip I didn't get a chance to share, but you can offer patients the opportunity to listen to music. Um, letting the patient tell you what will help him or her or them. And, and taking, you know, 30 extra seconds to do that, T- two minutes can make a big difference. We can cut that back in with the magic of, yeah. of editing. <laughs> Still recording, yeah. so that's perfect. Yes. That's great. Well, you know, the other thing I think Beth had asked about time. Oh, yeah, I did have a question yeah. about that in the script, like the, the, the limited amount of time people have in an appointment, you mean? That one? Yes, and I I think that's a really important point. I know we all have to stop, but... You know, I think time is like one of the hardest things we deal with, and we're not getting enough time for these complex patients. And I really believe that adopting a trauma-informed approach will save time in the long run because it will create more effective and potentially more efficient partnerships with patients, right? So I I think you're not going to do therapy, So it's not going to turn into a 50-minute therapy session. And you may find that when your patient feels heard and understood and has some insight into his, her, their behavior, that visits can eventually go go more smoothly. And this could this could transfer to the waiting room as well. I am such a big believer in that. It's just it's so nice to hear an expert actually say that because I really do feel the investment on front and establishing an open relationship and establishing trust and the visits are going to take forever the first couple but eventually you get to a point where you have an emotional shorthand and you know their history and you can you've covered all that ground and so you can actually kind of get to the meat of things it just it takes time that initial investment takes time but eventually it saves you time because you're not fighting through all that baggage that could have been there otherwise that's such a huge point yeah and the patients in internal medicine who are trauma exposed are also the high utilizers the uh, multi-morbid, highly complex, chronically ill patients. So perhaps getting to the root of what's really wrong is a way of um, of making their care 
um, more precise, right? Precision care. Yeah, Saul, Saul Wiener's book, the, he's another, he's a VA doc. We were talking about him the other night on a different podcast on, uh, he, his book is called On Becoming a Healer and him and his uh, research partner sent patients into clinics uh, the, the physicians didn't know and that they were plants. So they would, the patients would say like, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I lost my job recently and, you know, I know my sugar has been a little out of control. And a lot of the times the physician is just like leaning over the computer, like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, how much insulin are you taking? Okay. I'm going to order you more. And they've, they've literally proven that the physician is like sp- wasting time by avoiding that and would have saved time by addressing like the underlying reason, like whatever's going on in the person's life, like kind of being curious about what the patient says or what's going on with their life when they show up with an uncontrolled medical problem. And so there's, there's actually evidence to, to, uh, to back this up. It's not just your g- gestalt. Yeah. Oh, I a hundred percent believe that. And then, you know, as a closing suggestion you guys um, should really read this piece from Jeff Milstein in JGIM it's like we didn't really talk about humility but you know he basically writes about a patient that he's known for years and how he like basically missed her trauma and how ashamed he feels and then he realizes like you know I, I'm there for her yeah so thank you you're welcome have a great you night you too thanks so much Take care. Bye. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that one sit for a minute. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We're committed to providing you with high-value, practice-changing knowledge, and we want your feedback, so subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Beth Garbs Garbatelli, and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Matthew Frank Watto. I've been Beth Garbs Garbatelli. And we would be remiss if we did not thank the great Stuart Brigham for composing our theme music, as well as thanking the great Claire Morgan of Notley for editing our audio. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and good night. And thanks to our partner, VCU Health Continuing Education, who's helping us offer free CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information.